Thank you um, <clears throat> for the introduction. And I'd like to especially thank the, the organizers for the, the invitation. It's really, really a big pleasure to, to participate. Um, put all my devices on mute. Um, okay, so today um, I would like to talk about uh, results on the existence of global surface section for, for high flows in dimension three. The results I'm talking today are, uh, enjoyed to work with uh, Anna Florio, Vincent Collin, Pierre de Renoir, and Anna Rehtman. Okay, so let me start by giving the definition. I should also say that the notion of global surface section does not have a super universal definition, which is accepted by everyone. So everybody sometimes makes slightly different definitions. Um, <clears throat> so for me, I'm going to look at a closed three manifold with vector field. And the global surface section is going to be an embedded surface whose boundary consists of periodic orbits. The vector field is assumed to be transverse to the interior. And for every uh, point on the manifold, you have strictly positive and strictly negative times where the trajectory starting, such that the trajectory starting at that point hits the surface. Okay, so he here's the picture. Um, every trajectory of the flow is hitting this, this surface, uh, infinitely many often in the future and the past. Okay, so that's a, that's a tool. It's a tool to um, help understanding have flows dimension three, because then we can uh, reduce the state of the flow to the state of the return map. Um, sometimes it's uh, more convenient to talk about rational global surface sections, sometimes called big of sections, which is basically the same, but in this case, uh, the boundary components uh, might cover these uh, periodic orbits more than once. Okay, so this is, as, a, as I mentioned before, this is, this is a tool. And uh, first I'll spend some time trying to explain how, uh, why is this a useful tool? So let me um, describe a few applications. There are, there are many, many applications. I, I do not have time to describe even half of them, but um, I'll describe some. So the, the, the first set of applications uh, uh, is to systolic geometry on the two-sphere. A Riemannian two-sphere is pinched by a number delta, uh, strictly between zero, uh, bigger than zero and less or equal than one, if the minimum of the Gaussian curvature is bigger or equal than delta times the maximum, the maximum of the Gaussian curvature. Um, let me denote by L mean, the minimal length of a non-constant closed geodesic, and L max, the maximal length of an embedded closed geodesic. Um, and uh, one application which was proved uh, in collaboration with Alberto Bondando, Barney Bramham, and Pedro Salomon was using global surface of section was this uh, systolic inequality, um, which it, it, the result says that if the Riemannian metric is pinched by more than an explicit constant, which is about 0 0.83, then uh, this um, uh, Sisto square, I mean, some, sometimes people call L mean the Sisto, um, is not bigger than pi times the area. And if you have equality, actually the flow is periodic, the metric is so-called Zoll metric. So one, one aspect of this result is that it's not a perturbative result in the sense that you can actually have um, um, an explicit pinching condition, and that solves a conjecture of Babenko. And so let me tell you where the global surface section is. Um, the global surface section is the so-called Birkhoff annulus. If you have an embedded closed geodesic, at every point you can choose, a, so this divides the sphere into two hemispheres. At every point you can choose the bouquet of uh, unit vectors pointing towards a hemisphere, which is pre-chosen. And then you let uh, this purple dot vary over the geodesic 
We get an Amnulus embedded inside the unit sphere bundle, and that's a global source of section if the curvature is positive. So what happens is that if you start geodesic pointing towards one of the hemispheres, um, eventually you go back, change hemispheres, and change again, so you hit the surface again. That, that doesn't work in general. That only works if uh, the curvature is positive. So, so this, this return map is um, useful to prove the systolic inequality because we uh, are then able to apply certain uh, quantitative fixed point theorems to the return map and, and translate the systolic inequality into geometry into, into symplectic geometry. Okay, that's, that's how that's one application of the global surface section. Let me describe a couple of applications in for systolic inequalities of contact forms. Um, the first is a result by Muhat Saglam in higher dimensions, originally proved by us. Um, in dimension three, asserting that uh, on every closed contact manifold, you can find uh, 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 contact forms for which the, the minimal period, so this theme in here is the minimal period among closed head orbits. Um, so you can find contact forms for which this is uh, very big when compared to volume. Okay, so this means that uh, um, systolic inequalities uh, are not phenomena in contact topology. But to prove this result, one needs to use a lot of contact topology, in, in particular, global surfaces of section uh, uh, are constructed for this specific form, specific, specific form so that we can prove the, this higher systolic ratio. Another application to, to, to systolic inequalities of contact form is this uh, uh, result with, uh, again, with uh, Alberto Bani and Pedro. We, Established that the the can get dynamically convex contact forms on the three sphere with systolic ratio close to two, not bigger than two. We cannot do that so far. Maybe it's even impossible, but uh, close to two. And this is saying, in particular, that so-called weak Viterbo conjecture, which would ask that for convex bodies, this ratio is not bigger than one actually does not hold in the dynamically convex case. Both, both of these results are proved uh, by exploring global surfaces of section. OK. Let me move on to applications, some applications to symplectic topology. So in particular, as a corollary of the previous result, uh, Uniqueness of capacities uh, must fail for star-shaped domains in R4 with a dynamically convex boundary. But the, you know, if the systolic ratio is bigger, is it, is close to two, then the Gromov width will be can be arbitrarily close to 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 one over square root to one over square root of two times the minimal period. Hence, you get the same kind of ratio between the Gromov width and any symplectic capacity. Uh, given in terms of uh, periods of uh, period requirements. Okay, so let me describe some new applications to synthetic topology. Let's consider a, a, a smooth compact domain R4, the standard synthetic structure, and let's consider this number, a hop, which is the infimum of the uh, synthetic areas of uh, disk-like global surfaces of section on the boundary for the characteristic flow, okay? With the convention that if there are no such disks, then the, the, the infimum of the empty set is, is by, by definition plus infinity. Then um, taking advantage of this idea of global surface of section, we can now produce an, uh, a synthetic capacity. This is work with, uh, uh, Michael Hutchins and, and Vinicius Ramos, that uh, which we call this capacity C hop, uh, which is the supremum of A hop. So on a symplectic form manifold X, we consider all symplectic embeddings of a star shaped domain with the nebulous convex boundary into this manifold. And you, do, you take the supremum of this number A hop. So it's a sub inf. Uh, number, 
typical procedure in, in the, 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 the typical construction that we want to do among those when analyze the action function you can only find, it, can only find several points. Um, okay, so then uh, this is the symplectic capacity, which is defined in terms of um, global surface of section. Um, and then another result is that uh, this number is actually equal to, in the dynamically convex case, it's actual to, actually equal to the, the, the first ECH capacity. So let's uh, say a description of this first ECH capacity in this, in this case in terms of global surface of section. But the, the, I mean, in general, this capacity should, 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 all, should always coincide. I mean, you can only prove in the dynamic of this case. Uh, but the, 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 so one aspect which I find interesting here is that uh, the proof of the existence of this capacity, C-hop, is not, does not depend on cyber rhythm theory. It's, it's totally described in terms of uh, holomorphic curves. So maybe you can then see this as a way of understanding a little bit of you know, what's going on with VCH with no cyber rhythm theory. And then I, I, I cannot help myself from uh, mentioning these results, which I think are beautiful by, by Oliver at Maya, um, which take advantage of our work and use the, the fact that this capacity comes from global surface of section to prove the following. If, um, if this domain is uh, star-shaped with an amplitude convex boundary in R4, then the cylindrical capacity is actually equal to this, uh, to this, to, to C half. So there is a big gap, um, which is uh, closed um, in terms of lack of uniqueness of uh, symplectic capacities for the nuclear convex uh, uh, domains. And uh, yeah, well, maybe maybe in the convex case somebody can show also this is the Gromov wave, and then that would be a good result. But I think it's a, it's an interesting it's a, I think it's an interesting application of the idea of a global surface of section to symplectic topology. Okay, another cool result by Oliver is that uh, if you have a domain C3 close to the ball, then you actually have uh, uniqueness of capacities. I mean, be before with Alberto, Pedro, and, and, and Barney, we proved the weak Viterbo conjecture hold, which means that, uh, well, systolic ratio is not bigger than one if, if the domain C3 close to the unit pole. And here one gets a better result. Okay, so these are the, the, the applications I, I would like to mention about C-plate topology. Before moving on to applications in dynamics, let me mention an existence result. So one might ask, um, what are the conditions for a periodic orbit to span uh, a disk-like global surface of section uh, on the standard three sphere. And these are the conditions. I mean, the, the, the orbit has to be unknotted. The orbit has to have self-linking number minus one. Uh, the orbit has to have uh, coincidental index at least equal to three in a, in a global trivialization. And the orbit has to be linked to all periodic orbits with transverse rotation number equal to one, okay? Um, these conditions are, are not hard. It's not hard to see that they're necessary. It turns out they are, well, they're seen thin genetically necessary. It's a bit delicate, but it, they're always sufficient. So this means that uh, these results, uh, this, the, the, in terms of, you know, if you want to apply this result for building global surface section by checking these assumptions, one does not need to, one does not need to assume any generalistic assumption like non-degeneracy. Um, speaking of non-degeneracy, um, I mean, we know that uh, many contact forms are non-degenerate, but it's not so easy to, 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 to give them explicitly, right? I mean, it would be, I think it would be nice to, maybe, maybe somebody can just say an example now, I don't know, but uh, um, I, I don't know any examples of non-degenerate contact forms on say an S3 with uh, infinitely many periodic orbits. I mean, of course, they exist abundantly, 
but it's very hard to, 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 to write down an example. Similarly, it's not so easy to, to, to write down an example of a bumpy metric on S2. Okay. Um, I have a comment here in the chat, an example with uh, at least three orbits must happen to me. Yes, exactly. So I mean, that's why I, I, I'm asking here uh, for uh, a non-degenerate contact form uh, with infinitely many orbits, right? I mean, by, <laughs> by results of, uh, yeah, Christopher Gardner, uh, Michael and, and um, Pomeriliano and also Colin de Renoir Hatman and Hatman, uh, there are not examples with three orbits, right? If they're not degenerate. Okay. All right. So, so here's a picture again. If you have such a disk like global surface section, you can write the flow as a flow on a solid torus. You have this isotopy of maps on the disk. So let me then uh, move on to, to describe some applications dynamics. So there's this very nice result, which I think is, is, is super cool, is, is a result by Alberto, Marcelo, uh, Alves, Murat Saglam, and Felix Schlenk. You have entropy collapse, meaning in every contact manifold, you find head flows uh, with, um, uh, volume one, say, and small topological entropy. Of course, there is nothing to be done if your manifold admits of, uh, things with uh, zero entropy, but there are many folds which don't. So I think it's a, uh, and, and the proof is uh, a proof is based on global surface section. Um, another result which explores many things, but and also explores uh, global surface section as a result by Julian Scheides and Oliver Edmeyer. Ed um, there are star-shaped domains in R4 with, um, yeah, with dynamically convex boundary, which are not symplectomorphic to a strictly convex domain. I mean, there is the, the proof here uses many things. This is the well invariant, uses a lot of inequalities from coming from Riemann and geometry. And also you use the notion of global surface section to build the examples violating the inequalities that they get. Um, in higher dimensions, we don't have uh, methods which, which uh, are very, say, which can so far be used to solve this problem, but uh, there are very strong results by, by Victor Ginsburg and, and Leonardo Macari. Another application I'd like to mention, and it's probably my last application, is a combination of results by Frauenfeld and Kang um, about symmetric orbits. So if, if one has a dynamically convex energy level in R4, which is conjugation symmetric, then there are two or infinitely many conjugation symmetric closed orbits. I think that's it's a very nice statement uh, uh, and applies to certain regimes of the planar circular restricted three-body problem. Okay, so, so with this, I, I hope I was able to give an idea of why um, this is a useful uh, gadget, the global surfaces of section. Okay, so the, the, the pioneering result, say with symplectic topology methods is obtained by in the late 1990s by Hofer, Wysocki and Zander. They prove that the dynamically convex head flow on S3 always, have, always has a disk like global surface section. Um, in particular, we have by applying results of John Franks, it only has two or 15 many periodic orbits. And uh, yeah, that's uh, say the, 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 the model result, say the, the draw from, from where one draws inspiration using modern methods. 
So I, I would just like to, to comment. So here one has the global services section and as an application has two or three many periodic parties, which is a very nice application. But I mean, one can argue that, so the, the, the two or infinity conjecture um, is a very strong statement and it's a statement about all head flows. And maybe that's the reason why it's a very strong statement. But one doesn't necessarily learn too much about the structure of the flow from knowing that it has infinitely many periodic coordinates. I mean, I, I would argue that uh, here, one learns a lot more by knowing that there is the disk collectible surface section than from knowing that there are two or infinitely, infinitely many periodic coordinates. Um, but, well, in, in the case of two orbits, there is, there is a, 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 one can get a, a, a structural characterization, um, which is that head flows with only two orbits can only exist on standard lens spaces or S3. And they admit disk-like global surfaces section whose return maps are pseudo-rotations. But there are many consequences in particular, uh, the orbits are irrationally elliptic, the link of the orbits can be characterized. Um, it has precise relation between actions, rotation numbers, and contact volume, just like in the irrational ellipsoid. But the consequence I want to stress is that now all, all statements and conjectures about pseudo rotations might have a version for, for HEP flows with two orbits. For instance, one might ask, as uh, Helmut Hofer did, uh, that whether a, 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 a contact form with two orbits with the time rotation number of the orbits is, uh, uh, is strictly contactomorphic to, to an ellipsoid, to an irrational ellipsoid with the given time rotation numbers, or one might want to try to prove rigidity statements about how uh, a, contact of, a contact form on S3 with two orbits um, and maybe with some UV assumption, the rotation numbers um, is the boundary of a domain can be realized as a boundary of the domain that can be approximated by simple ectomorphic images of rational ellipsoids, just imitating uh, rigidity statements that were approved by, by Barney Bramham. We can try to transport these statements to this context. So it's a nice application, it's a bridge that the global surface section is gapping from flows to maps. Okay, let me, let me then start talking about the new results. Um, so in, in the eighties, there was a celebrated paper by Berman and Williams who proposed to study uh, knots and links of periodic orbits as a way of understanding dynamics from a qualitative point of view. Right, you can read these questions right here. So, I mean, uh, uh, which orbits are knotted, which orbits are not knotted, what kinds of knots can occur, and what are the implications? That was a, that was a very celebrated result, still isn't today. And uh, so in this paper, they studied the, the, the Lorentz attractor. So the, the, the study of knots as, as, a, as a mathematical subject initiated with uh, Lord Kevin, in fluid dynamics. And in the 60s, Lorentz proposed a, a, a certain simplification of the, uh, of, uh, the, of the equations which model convection rows. Uh, this, is, this is about the, I'm not a specialist, of course, and this is about how um, um, uh, the air flows in the atmosphere. And uh, so this is a system of equations in R3, and it, it has a, an interesting attractor, an interesting variant set, which is called the Lorentz attractor. So here we see some parameters. There is sigma, there is R, uh, there is B. And in some, in some parameter, if you choose the parameters appropriately, you have uh, some very interesting attractor showing up. And this attractor contains many periodic orbits, infinitely many periodic orbits, and these orbits are the so-called Lorentz knots. And then the result proved by Berman and Williams is that all Lorentz knots are fibers. Okay, so we have 
this, this uh, butterfly-like uh, um, invariant and has many periodic orbits and these orbits are all fibered, all fibered knots. So there's a huge restriction on the, on the, on the Lorentz knots. So in general, one could ask analogous questions for head flows. How bad the knots uh, and the links of periodic orbits can be um, uh, for a head flow on the, on the standard three sphere? And there is a, a, a result uh, by Etnair and Greist saying that the answer is, is very bad. There are real analytic head flows on on, on the standard three sphere that realize uh, all knot types simultaneously. On the other hand, we have the hot flow, okay? So, which is a, a flow, it's a hop, it's a hop flow on S3 and it has the exact, the exact opposite. We are exactly in the, in the opposite end of the spectrum. We are, we are in a situation that is only one knot type. So you have this one special flow with one knot type and you have extremely complicated flows with all knot types simultaneously. And we can now try to uh, uh, quantify this behavior going from the knot, from the hop flow, which has only one knot type to this flow, which have all knot types at the same time. So with this, in this purpose, uh, with, with this goal in mind, well, I don't know, let's say, at least with one of, one of the, I don't know, many goals perhaps with this, this one goal in mind, that there is a definition by ATNGs, uh, which is saying, uh, which is the definition of right-handed flow. A non-singular vector field on a homology three sphere is a right-handed flow if any two Borel invariant probability measures link positively. Of course, I have to, then one has to explain what does it mean for for uh, uh, two probability measures to link positively or negatively. Um, but I'm not going to go through the details, but one can uh, imagine that one follows uh, recurrent points and they close when they close when, when these trajectories come back to, to the initial point you close them up, you compute the linking number. Of course, it's a bit uh, ambiguous how one closes the orbits up and Still, if you divide by the time it takes, the product of the times uh, this limit exists for an ergodic measure for a generic point. And then, you know, using the ergodic decomposition theorem can talk about then uh, uh, other uh, measures which are not ergodic. And then what is an example? The hop flow. Hop flow, again, uh, showing up as an example, it's a, it's a right-handed flow. Um, you see that all trajectories are linking with the same rate as you flow with the time. And the, the, uh, all trajectories have linking number one. In particular, they're all positive. Okay, so it's not so easy. I mean, it's not so difficult to construct right-handed flows, but it's not so easy to find them. I mean, to find examples which are not, say, artificially constructed. The hop flow is one. Of course, one can play with some other integrable flows and there is, uh, you can, can find integrable flows which are right-handed. Uh, one can construct uh, artificially also no integrable right-handed flows, but it's not so easy to find them in given families of flows. So what's, what, what's motivation for the, um, definition of right-handedness because so the motivation can be thought of as a way of identifying exactly that phenomenon that makes that forces periodic orbits to be all at once uh, uh, fibered links fibered knots or fibered links so one has this result by ATNG saying that uh, all finite collections of periodic orbits of right-handed flow spawn a, spawn a global surface section in particular they're all fibered links the, the Lorentz, so the, the Lorentz flow is not really right-handed, but it's, uh, it's almost. So in particular, you have the, on the, on the left, you have the unknot that's allowed because it's a, it's a fibered knot, of course. 
have the we have the figure eight knot. It's also allowed fiber knot. But then you have examples of uh, knots which are not which are not fibered. And they're not fibered because the, the you know if, if you look at the the kernel of the linking number of the knot in the fundamental group of the complement of the knot, this is not uh, finitely generated. We can compute that. And then there are infinitely many knots which are not allowed. And every and not only that, uh, if you if you have such a condition of the condition of right-handedness, not only you can know that the links of periodic orbits are fibered, but also know how uh, you know a lot about how the periodic orbits position themselves respect each other because they're always linking positively. In particular, uh, um, every so every orbit you might try to study uh, uh, if you know any given orbit is forcing entropy or not by the use of Thurston Nielsen theory. That's a, that's an open door in that direction. Then the natural question is, let's try to find more flows. Uh, there is a question by, by Giz himself uh, asking whether, so which geodesic flows are left or right-handed. The distinction between left and right-handedness is not so important. One can always reverse the diameter orientation and change left to higher to right. So on the two sphere, I mean, the, by definition, right-handed flows cannot exist in the in the in, in for homology three spheres, otherwise uh, there is no linking number. You can even talk about rational homology three spheres, in which case the linking numbers are rational numbers, which means that for for surfaces, uh, if you talk about geodesic flows, I mean, the only case in which the unit the so you can only to have a homology three sphere, only the two spheres allowed. But uh, if if you allow orbit folds. Then uh, there is a, a result by Pierre de Renoir st stating that um, the geodesic flow on a hyperbolic three conic two sphere, that's some orbifold uh, where you want one constructs out of the two sphere using three singularities, three orbifold points. Uh, and if you can put a, a hyperbolic orbit there, and in this case, it's right hand, it's left handed. Um, so then one can also ask the corresponding question uh, for head flows. What head flows are, are right-handed, say on S3, on the standard S3? Um, is is right-handedness being implied by, by, by dynamical convexity? Probably the answer is no, but uh, it's maybe not so easy to find an example. Uh, then, so now uh, let me try to describe then a parameter that can be used to, 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 to say, uh, uh, parameterize a bit the, 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 the set of head flows starting from the hop flow going in the direction of more wild flows. Uh, this parameter is only defined, uh, I mean, you can think of it uh, uh, in general, but uh, it's, it makes more sense in the dynamically convex case. So let's, let's, let's uh, fix dynamically convex contact form on the standard three sphere. Um, let's consider an unknotted closed head orbits with self-linking minus one. So these orbits are exactly those which bound, which span global surfaces of section. And let's consider this number kappa, which is the following. I mean, one considers points uh, uh, x out of the periodic orbit, points not in the periodic orbits. One considers vectors uh, on the tangent structure, on the contact structure at those points. And then one, one, div one takes the, some positive time t, and one sees how much the linearized flow rotated, starting from the vector u uh, up to time t in, in a global trivialization. And then divide this by how much time, how much times roughly this trajectory, which is, might not be periodic, how much time this trajectory, how much, how many times this trajectory uh, linked with that spawning orbit gamma. So this, this is some kind of big of sum. 
right? I mean, this is uh, looks at the, the disk map, and then, well, the denominator is the number of times you, you iterated the return map, so to speak, and you see how much the linearized flow rotated. And then, okay, so that, that's a parameter we're going to use to quantify a bit right handedness. So, for instance, for the hop flow, <clears throat> this number is uh, 4 pi. 4 pi because uh, uh, when you hit, when you go back to the disk, you went exactly one period. And we know that the linearized flow in the global trivialization rotated twice. So, twice times a full turn, this means 4 pi angle. That's uh, for the hop flow, it's 4 pi. This number. And then the result with one result with Anna is that <coughs> um, if, if this number is bigger than two pi, then the flow is right-handed. So that opens um, a, 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 say uh, a, um, some space in the space of contact forms where you can check right-handedness. So in particular, for instance, if you have a strictly convex boundary of a smooth convex body, if you have the, the infimum of the sectional curvatures times the infimum of the return time to some global surface section bigger than pi over two, then the, the flow is right-handedness, is right-handed, and you have all, that, all those restrictions on the, on the period requirements. Okay, so for instance, here for the, for the three sphere, for the round three sphere, this is, this is pi. It, it's interesting to try to understand from, from a symplectic topological point of view, it's interesting to try to understand how close can we make this infimum on the return time to the infimum among periods of period quarks. That's the, I mean, if, if that would be the case, I and mean, if there were, if there would be a relation, then this result here would have uh, um, many more applications. But the main application I'd like to to, to emphasize with the work of in the work of with Anna is um, that you have Riemannian two spheres, uh, uh, many Riemannian geodesic flows on the two sphere which are right-handed. Particularly if the geodesic flow is pinched by an explicit constant. Which is, a, I mean, it's a little bit less than this number, but this number is enough, 0 0.72. Then uh, you, you get right handedness of the, of the geodesic flow and uh, you get an explicit set of geodesic flows where can, one can check this condition. Um, I, can I ask how many, how much more time? I, I, I have maybe another 10 minutes. I think you have uh, 20, no? 20, okay. Sorry. I'll probably use a little bit less, but okay. Okay, so, so thank you. So the, the <clears throat> I mean, if there are any questions, please uh, interrupt me. Um, uh, um, Right, so this is, this is the, the application. The, the application is to check this condition and to find main flows where you can have all this restriction, all these this very strong restrictions that we are required. There are, there are other restrictions which follow from right-handedness uh, in terms of elicity, using result, the results of uh, 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 De Hohenois and Hertmann. But um, yeah, that's the one application I'd like to mention. There are other applications as well. Okay, so that's the first result on abundance of global surface section I, I wanted to, to, to mention today. Um, for a given flow, can one see uh, many global surface section? Can you derive applications to not types of period requirements, to how the period, period requirements look relative to each other? That's, that's the, the conclusion uh, of this, this set of applications. Okay, so now let me move to generalistic results for rational global surfaces of section. So this is this is uh, 
joint work with uh, Vincent Collin, Pierre de Renoir, and Anna Rechtman. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's easier just to first state the result and then I'll try to understand the tools and the proof, try to explain the tools and the proof. <coughs> <clears throat> so the result is, is that a C1 generic hep flow on a closed three manifold carries a rational global surface section. And a C infinite generic contact form on a homology three sphere car carries a rational global surface section. Um, today, we, I, I noted uh, that uh, there is a, also a very nice uh, preprint by, by Marco and, and Gonzalo for uh, also results like this uh, for geodesic flows. Um, okay, so let me, let me explain a bit the, the idea of proofs. So I think uh, there is not one way of proving such results. Um, I'll, I'll explain uh, uh, um, today a, a proof of the second statement using a little bit of ergodic theory. Uh, and here I should, so for this statement here, uh, <coughs> at least for the proof I'm going to explain today, uh, so there is a, there is a Humbunak alert. So I know, I know that some people are not very happy of using the Humbunak theorem. So this, there is a Humbunak alert for this proof here. I think, the, I think we only need Humbunak in situations where can get away with uh, the countable axiom of choice. But anyway, I didn't check this. I mean, I like the Humbonic theorem. So there, I think there is also more than, more than one way of proving this vote, but anyway, there is a Humbonic alert. Okay, so what are the tools? The tools are, are the main tools are, are these ones. Um, and the, the heavier tool is the last one. Well, maybe the first and the last. Um, let me explain a bit um, how these tools are, are combined to get the result. The first, the first uh, tool is EDA's equity distribution theorem, which is a, a quantitative improvement of the C-infinity closing lamp. Um, basically, one can say, so the result says that the, um, the ergodic decomposition of the normalized Liouville measure can be done up to small error with finitely many, with sequences of uh, finitely many com collections of periodic particles. Um, then there is a, a result with, in collaboration with David Bechara Senior uh, and Pedro Salomão, uh, where we explore average linking numbers of trajectories of periodic particles to, 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 to give a, a, a description of the period of a period requirement, the action of period requirement. So term, roughly speaking, the <clears throat> how much, a, how much a, a typical, if you, if, you, if you average how much a typical point asymptotic links with a period requirement, you get the period of the period requirement. That's the second tool. So the third tool in the proof of the, um, this particular proof I'm going to explain now, is uh, the theory of asymptotic cycles. That's, that goes by the name of Schwartzman fit sullivan theory. That's a, that's a, a, a generalization of the, to, to flows in dimension three to, to, to the idea of, so, so to, of, of Poincaré's rotation. So no Poincaré's rotation number is a number associated to a circle diffeomorphism. And the idea is that if you have a, a flow on a three manifold, if you have a, hom a cohomology class, this cohomology class gives an opportunity to to for the flow to go around. And so you can measure some kind of rotation number associated to invariant measures. Okay, so that's the idea that goes back to the 50s. And then we have again, so the first result it is a distribution theorem was proved uh, with uh, ECH methods. Then we have again the the heavy machinery of ECH playing a role in uh, uh, describing this uh, transverse foliation of the flow, which, which are, uh, um, it's called broken book decompositions. And uh, one does, um, yeah, takes advantage of this uh, structure to check the, the, the assumptions that one needs to, to check 
in order to apply asymptotic cycles. So let's let me state the the, the, the tools. So it is a distribution theorem asserts that for a C infinity genetic contact form, and he, here's the C infinity genetic uh, assumption that uh, we need. I mean, we need the, 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 the non degeneracy of the contact form plus this condition here. Uh, we need the, the, that this result is valid, that the conclusion of this result is valid, which, is that, which means that uh, for um, you, you can find sequences uh, of finite collection of periodic orbits and sequences of weights. These weights are numbers uh, between one, zero and one. So here it's, uh, there's a type, it should be P, N, J, N. So you have a uh, collections of periodic orbits and the number of periodic orbits in each collection is depending on, on N, also the number of weights. I, sh I also forgot to say that these weights, they add up to one. Okay, it's a bunch of weights adding up to one. And then here on, on the, on the left-hand side, one has a, a probability measure, a Borel invariant measure. And the theorem is that genetically, you can be sure that to find such collections in such a way that the, the normalized the UV measure can be approximated in this way by uh, in the weak star topology. So that's the, the equidistribution theorem of EDA. So it's a, it's a much better, much stronger statement than the usual infinity closing lemma. Okay, so second, uh, second tool is this um, a, a way of using linking numbers to get periods of periodic orbits, uh, which is so-called uh, action linking lemma. So I'll state it only for the case of homology three spheres. Uh, suppose you have a homology three sphere. And suppose you have a contact form on, on this on this manifold, then it's possible to define uh, the linking number with uh, sorry, I forgot to say here gamma is a periodic orbit. Okay. It's possible to define the linking number of the normalized uh, Liouville Lewy measure with the periodic orbits. And I'll, I'll explain in a second what this means. But then the, the result is that you, you get back the, the, the uh, period of the periodic order with that. So what's the linking number? The linking number here is, is the following. You, 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 you fix, um, so basically one can use the robotic theorem to say that for almost every point, oh, this, so for almost, uh, almost every point, this point is a current and the following is true. You start following the trajectory for large times uh, coming back near the initial points and you close to get, a, to get a loop. Then you compute the linking number with gamma of this loop. It'll take a limit as the time goes to infinity. And then at, uh, you get a, a well-defined integrable function uh, uh, on almost every point. Define on almost every point and we integrate you get the, that's by definition this linking number. So one can recover this. Um, the, so from, from the average linking number of a typical trajectory, you, you, you recover the period of the given orbit. Then a, a corollary is that for, I mean, if, I, if, I, if, you, if you apply this combined with, uh, with uh, the equidistribution theorem, you see that here the, the, the the, the measure here can be approximated by these weighted collections of uh, measures given by periodic orbits, which means that uh, the conclusion, as a conclusion, for any finite collection of periodic orbits, for the, for the genetic contact form, one has periodic orbits, which are different than these ones. So this and many, many periodic orbits here, but all in the complement of the given ones such that, and, and positive integers, such that <clears throat> the, the linking number of this uh, uh, one cycle, given by this combination of the periodic orbits, gamma one, gamma n, with each of these orbits, h1, hm, is positive. 
Okay, so that's the tool. The tool is to get, given a bunch of orbits, you can find a, a, a perhaps a very large collection of extra periodic orbits, which link positively with given orbits. Okay, so at this point, you can, I can already <clears throat> hint towards the idea of the proof, which is given a foliation like the finite energy foliations of Hofer, Zosky, and Zander, or like the broken book decompositions of Hollande, Hohenwein, and Hertmann, can try to find additional orbits which are going to be somehow killing the binding orbits of the foliation. To, so the, the, the hyperbolic broken orbits of the binding orbits of the foliation in order to resolve the foliation into a global surface section. Okay. The third tool, that's, that's where the harmonic alert should be blink, uh, uh, how do you call it, blink, blinking, um, is, the, is the field of asymptotic cycles. So here, uh, let me state a special case. So if you have a homology tree sphere, um, actually here it doesn't have to be a homology tree sphere. This statement is true just like that. Um, yeah, for, for any closed three manifold of a flow. And this has nothing to do with the flow being a HEP flow or coming from Hamiltonian dynamics. This is really a statement about uh, general flows. Um, suppose one has uh, closed three manifold, a link of periodic orbits, and one, consider, one considers the, <clears throat> the space of uh, invariant Borel probability measures in the complement of these uh, periodic orbits. And um, suppose one also fix a cohomology class in the complement, degree one cohomology class in the complement. In the complement. Then, just, just mimicking the procedure I explained before, one can talk about the intersection number of such an invariant measure with the cohomology class. Okay, again, one uh, takes a typical point with respect to this measure, it's going to be a recurrent point, and so you follow this point until it comes back close to itself. You close, you get a loop, you, you hit the, this loop with, uh, with uh, the cohomology class, you get a number. So take the limit as the times get bigger and bigger. For a typical point is going to converge to, to a number that defines a function which is actually integrable with respect to the, respect to the original invariant measure. Then you integrate it you get the, the intersection numbers. So that's, that's a real value intersection number between the invariant measure and uh, the cohomology class. So let's assume that's positive. Let's assume that also the rotation number of every component of this link, uh, transverse rotation number of the periodic orbit of every component of this link with respect to the cohomology class is positive, okay? This is also not so difficult to describe, but there is one picture to be kept in mind, which is, see, if you, if you want the link to, to span a global surface section, then let's, let's pretend for a second that Y is the Poincaré dual of the section. Then these conditions are, are true, right? The linearized rotation along the orbit is hitting positively the section and uh, the invariant measures of the complement are also hitting positively the section, so you want everything to be positive. And the theorem states the converse. If uh, you have positivity in this sense, then you can, well, of course, it's a bit technical, so you can find a sublink which spans a global surface section. So that's, that's where the Hambanek plays a role. And the final tool is uh, the trans the foliation. Okay, so one has uh, for non-degenerate half flows, one has transverse foliations, which are nice. Uh, and that's where so one should think of this result here uh, as a result which has hypotheses which are difficult to check. And I... mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, the original paper by Sullivan used Hanbanach, right? Yes. So, so, so it's, I mean, when you say Hanbana alert, it's probably in the same spirit as Sullivan used it in, in his paper. Exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you. 
So I, I, I was going to ask, is there a connection between the, this was, if you go back to the previous slide, I mean, you fix the Y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let, let's put I, know, I, I was going to say, if you could, the Y is not, is this, uh, Okay, never mind. I just finished reading. Let's, uh, let's say okay. like this: the y, the y wants to be the point I do of the section. So, can you show it is, or, or does the theorem say it is, or not? That's what that's what I was wondering, actually. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> well, no, but uh, so it's related. Really, it's related to the point I do of the section. It's related. There is a relation. Uh huh. Okay. okay. Exactly. So, so, so there is there is more to the theorem than what you you've written. There's some sort of a connection between the global surface of section and the y. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So let me then I want to explain the proof now with just a, a few pictures. So theorem A checked uh, with holomorphic curves using uh, basic Bromov-Witten theory on CP2. Uh, um, that does the job for the standard three sphere. Uh, in theorem B, one needs to use, that's the CDR here stands for Colon de Hohenwald and Hetman. This is, you know, one needs to use uh, the full machinery of the CH and its relation to cyber Witten theory to get these curves, to get the existence of these curves. So then one takes the results so one can actually check the assumption of this result. And this, this is a result which one never checks the assumptions. It's a beautiful result, wonderful uh, hypothesis with wonderful conclusions, but it's difficult to check the hypothesis. And then the holomorphic curves, they, they, check, they check the hypothesis. All right, so let me give an example. So here's, I draw here um, what's called a three to three foliation of the standard uh, three sphere. So we have three periodic orbits. This is the binding orbits. Um, and you have leaves, okay? So uh, you have, say, in the middle here, you think of a positive hyperbolic orbit and you have a cylinder towards this, uh, connecting this hyperbolic orbit here with the, these other orbits. And the same on the other side. And you have a plane. So this is a plane for this hyperbolic orbit. This, out here is also a plane, so you have a sphere. The left-hand side is inside of a two-sphere. The right-hand uh, the right -hand side is inside is the inside of a two-sphere. You have these cylinders, and you have these one-parameter families of family of planes. Okay, that's actually happening uh, when you do when you go through a critical lab on certain systems in Hamiltonian and selection mechanics. I draw some trajectories or pieces of trajectories and vector, and vector field. So you see the hyperbolic orbit, the stable and stable manifold, the flow is going this way, but some trajectories might come rotate a bit here and then rotate a bit here and then go back. Nice, so the, the argument of Hofer, Zuskin, Zinner from the, the late, for the early 2000s is that such a picture forces homoclinic connection. That's how they prove that one gets entropy genetically, if you have the Kupkas-Mayo condition. That's an argument by Hofer, Zuskin, Zander. And what's the idea? Ah, by the way, we're talking about on the genetic hyperflows, flows, but such foliations can be found uh, in concrete flows. And I would like to highlight results like this because it's very hard to find an example of a non-degenerate hyperflow. flow, but there are uh, specific systems which are of interest in celestial mechanics and we can actually find these foliations result of uh, De Paolo and Salomon. So let's go back, now I can, I can finish the proof. So here, here's the foliation. So suppose you have only this extra orbit here. Suppose you find this extra periodic orbit. In this example. So then one can actually get the global surface section. Okay, so let's, let's just think about this example. We have this foliation and this extra orbit here. So the first step is to, so we have these four orbits. Three orbits are, are in the foliation. You have one, the purple orbits, the only broken orbit, and you have the extra orbit. Let's blow this orbit, these orbits up and get a manifold with a flow 
which has four components in the bound and in the four boundary components, each boundary component is an invariant torus. Okay. So that's it. Every invariant measure. So just look at the picture. Every invariant measure. Let's let's think of the ergodic measures on this compact space which obtained by blowing up, by blowing up. I mean, if 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 the complement of the blue orbit has measure one, you see every orbit is linking with the following cohomology class. You just take a positive number times the cohomology class given by linking the rigid leaves plus the other cohomology class, which is given by linking with the extra orbit. Okay? So the, the, the invariant measures in the complement of the four orbits are linking with the first positively because of the foliage. And they might link a bit negatively with the other cohomology class because you don't know how they're positioned with respect to the extra orbit. But if you crank up this parameter here, you get positivity for these invariant measures. And the other invariant measures are the ones which are supported on the boundary totals of the hyperbolic orbits. They have zero linking number of the rigid leaves, but they have positive linking number of the extra orbit because the extra orbit is assumed to be linking positively with the purple orbit. That's the end. Now we get positivity via, um, um, via um, ergodic decomposition theorem, and that's the end of the proof. So the extra orbit in practice, some of the, the, so in practice, you have a broken book decomposition with many, many purple orbits, and the extra orbit is not only one orbit. It's many, many orbits, but the, the argument is just that. Okay, so I think I, I, I have some questions in the chat, but anyway, I, I stop here. Thank you for, for your attention. Sorry for the extra time. Okay, so yeah, there, there's a basically a whole discussion on the chat. <laughs> Do you guys, maybe Chris or Michael or Vincent, if you want to say something? I think my question, to the extent that it was a question, has been answered. Okay. So basically, Chris says that he believes that the result by um, Colan and people result depends on the isomorphism ECH with Hegefler as opposed to cyber -Witten. And Michael said that they only need that the UMAP is non-trivial, but he doesn't remember if the isomorphism with Hegefler says something about the UMAP, and Vincent says that yes. As far as I understood, so thank you. Um, any other questions? Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, so you know, you said uh, this infinity generic existence of uh, uh, global search of sections is for uh, for homology spheres. Now you had a bunch of ingredients that go into the proof. It was like three or four, and so. You know, for example, the broken book decompositions that exist on other contact manifolds, the areas equidistribution distribution is also true on other contact manifolds. So mm -hmm. can you say why, what, what, what is not there on other contact manifolds? The link. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's the, the, this word here. I mean, here we could replace uh, linking with rigid leaves. I mean, I could have written intersection with rigid leaves, that's okay. The problem is, this, is, is the word link with, so here, link with other orbits. And that's what can be resolved in the, um, in the, in the general case for, uh, in, for the C1 generic results, because one, one takes advantage of the homoclinic connections to actually find these extra orbits, which are also new homologs. And then we can, here in the general case, one can say intersection with the two cycle spanned by these extra orbits, which are further now known that, uh, that are in addition are known to be new homologs. So the problem is that we, this is just a simplifying as hypothesis to make this proof work so that we can talk about linking numbers and being in peace with, the, with this, say, part of the proof. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's very likely that um, one can, yeah. Maybe very likely that one can extend this to, to more general three manifolds. 
So can you say get? Uh, so what what do you do to get C one? So, right. So, um, and one, for for other manifolds. So that, that's a, yeah. One would get out of the homoclinic connections. One would say use versions of closing lemmas to get orbits which link again with this uh, purple orbit here. I see. And these are I see. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a yeah, it's a totally technical at this point. Yeah, but, but there's something like, like in S3, in S3, in S3, all these complications that disappear on, on homology three spheres. Everything is extremely clean. In this picture here, if you actually have a half flow with this foliation on the screen, with this one extra orbit, you do get a global surface section. In this, extra, in this case here, it could be that the, extra, the global surface section is just this, extra, just this disk like global surface section given give by the extra orbit. It could be. That could be the case. Okay. Um, may I ask you? So you had a couple of results where uh, curvature of uh, Riemannian metric on the sphere, two sphere, entered mm -hmm. the, the play. Mm -hmm. uh, how you process this information in symplectically? So how the curvature appears? Yeah, so that's a, I, I think that's an excellent question in the sense that it's a, there's a lot of research motivated by a question, by such a question that can be done. Um, uh, let me go back to here, right? So here you have this pinching condition. So the, this, this result is proved by, by checking this condition. So, I mean, we lift the Riemannian, the geodesic flow to S3 and we want to check this uh, condition here. And so the, this number, let me go back here. This number uh, um, is, is made of um, quotients of numbers which are given. So the numerator here is, is a amount of rotation, the linearized flow in the global trivialization. And then the denominator, which is a problem, which is the linking number, say asymptotic linking, you're linking more and more with the disk flight global surface section. And that's very hard to control. In the case of geodesic flows on the two sphere, we have also the, an, an, an auxiliary uh, global surface section, which is the Birkhoff annulus. And so we want to estimate this number. So we want to, to get a grip on this number by looking at the uh, intersection asymptote. So instead of looking at link with the orbit, we start looking at uh, comparing this number to how many times you hit the, the, the Birkhoff annulus. And then the, the time it takes to hit the Birkhoff annulus, they would say the return time the Birkhoff annulus can be controlled in terms of curvature by uh, comparison theorems, such as Toponogov's result, Toponogov's comparison theorem. So that, that's, how, that's how we do it. But I think it's uh, uh, the question is um, can we understand from a symplectic topology point of view, can we get a relation between? the minimum of the return time to the global surface section to some, something which is, uh, makes sense in terms of symplectic topology. So I think one can uh, try to hope to get this minimal return time on a global surface section close or compatible to the minimal period of the periodic orbits. So, I mean, in general, this, this minimal return time can be actually close to zero. There is no comparison. If you're just given the global surface section, there's no comparison that one can hope for. But maybe one can change the global surface section for another one so that this minimal return time can be somehow compared to the minimal period of period requirements. And then this, this inequality here, which is involving, which is a, a guaranteeing right handedness, which is involved the minimal return time would be transformed into an inequality, which is now connecting symplectic topology through the minimal period and the curvatures of the convex body. That's a different curvature here. So this is a different setup. So we, we have this strange pinching condition because of the, it's an artifact of the proof. But um, yeah, 
one, I believe that uh, one can go down to one fourth, which is the which is the sharp condition for dynamical convexity. There's another question in, in the chat. Zijing, would you like to speak up? Okay, so would you mind going back to a few first few pages? Thank you. Which one? Good. Oh, okay. Back to back two pages. Back two? Yeah. Here. No. You you tell me if I go forward or back. Um back. And back. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 